Yes, hello and a warm welcome also from me to the presentation, The Relevance of UNESCO Learning Concepts for Heritage Interpretation. Um, you saw Matteo Rosati from UNESCO this morning um, in our panel discussion on the panel, and some of you might have remembered that they saw him before uh, last year as one of the keynote speakers of our conference in Sarajevo. Um, and after this conference, uh, we actually went into cooperation and we were planning for a workshop that took place in uh, October in Germany. And within this process, we had a lot of exchange and discussions about uh, UNESCO and how heritage interpretation could support UNESCO and vice versa. Um, and what I described to you today is basically a result uh, of this discussion. And it's um, a status because we are still cooperating with UNESCO continuing with this. Um, and I'm also happy for any feedback you have in this concern, because we are still in this process. Um, I'm convinced that this is a win-win situation, so that the interpretive profession can benefit a lot of, from what UNESCO did uh, in last decades, and that also we could support UNESCO much better um, in achieving their goals than we did so far. So this win-win situation um, has two perspectives, and there are two questions basically behind. Um, the first one, how can interpretation better support learning experiences at UNESCO designated sites? And the second from the other side, how can UNESCO learning concepts contribute to the development of the interpretive profession? So this is what this presentation will be all about. And um, I decided to um, take four steps towards this. Um, the first question is, what does UNESCO expect from heritage interpretation? So are there any expectations? Um, the second, from the other side, again, what might be the claims of heritage interpretation for its own development? Then I will have a look in the concepts um, in the learning programs that UNESCO has. And finally, I will try to answer the question, what can heritage interpretation do to support UNESCO? So starting with the first question, what does UNESCO expect from heritage interpretation? I brought you a short film that is mainly uh, referring to the Sustainable Development Goals. You might know that the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 Sustainable Development Goals, are part of a program of the United Nations, so not just from UNESCO. Um, and that the goal is that we achieve sustainable development until 2030, and UNESCO is playing an important role in this. So this film is uh, focusing on sustainable development goals, but it also explains what UNESCO is standing for. It's a little bit echoing, but you will, um, you will hear it uh, two and a half minutes. So just lean back, enjoy, and uh, then we'll talk about this. The world needs more education, sciences and culture to find sustainable solutions to the challenges of today, to build peace, combat climate change and end extreme poverty. We must focus on innovation, creativity and new ideas. We need to share knowledge so as to move forward. Every day UNESCO trains and supports researchers, teachers, journalists and artists to inform and educate, open our minds and foster respect. Since 1945, UNESCO has acted as a laboratory of ideas, imagining tomorrow's world, building peace in the minds of men and women. Today our mission is more relevant than ever helping 260 million out-of-school children and young people get an education and teaching skills to nearly 800 million adults worldwide, two-thirds of them women who can neither read nor write. We need to act now to protect human rights and dignity. The United Nations has defined 17 goals to achieve sustainable development by 2030. To succeed, we must invest in the forces that drive sustainable change train 70 million new teachers and ensure everybody can receive quality education. Ensure the transmission of heritage to new generations and embrace cultural diversity so that we may understand and respect one another. 
defend freedom of expression and access to information, strengthen scientific cooperation to protect our planet and its ocean, To achieve these pressing goals, we need to build bridges and stronger partnerships with governments, businesses, civil society and citizens. Join us today in turning these goals into reality. Together, let's mobilize our collective intelligence and bring out the best in our shared humanity. So this was what UNESCO is standing for, what they are aiming for. Um, and you might have some words in your mind that are still resonating. I put them together here, building peace, combating climate change, ending extreme poverty and protecting our planet and its oceans. So these are the big goals and there were some other um, things mentioned that had more to do with interaction of people like understanding and respecting one another sharing knowledge and opening our minds building bridges and stronger partnerships and fostering human rights and dignity so this is unesco's portfolio and when we are talking about um, heritage sites the question is um, how can we how can we use all these these goals or how can we include them in what we do in interpretation and heritage sites? Should we do this? Um, and actually UNESCO is asking for in terms of uh, the UNESCO designated sites. So the geoparks or biosphere reserves, world heritage sites. Um, but actually these ideas should be communicated there and it should not just be a label that these sites receive. Um, UNESCO developed this model for this. It's only now for UNESCO designated sites. Um, and you see that if you're thinking about World Heritage sites, usually you have a, an outstanding universal value that's defined and uh, based on this, the sites receive UNESCO designation. So UNESCO designation and the reason for UNESCO designation is uh, one part of the story. But um, in this diagram, UNESCO shows that they also want um, the sites to emphasize the sites values, which are um, always seen in the, against the background of sustainability. So um, in economic, ecological and social terms, the sites broader context, um, which means the region and the situation the people are living in actually, and also UNESCO's values which is what we saw in the film, like um, peace and sustainability. So strong um, values, big concepts in the background. So actually, this is the idea that um, the sites emphasize this. And uh, there's some research done that shows that um, that doesn't happen very often. So we have UNESCO World Heritage sites that hardly communicate uh, the outstanding universal value. Um, and they do not refer at all to um, the region or the problems the people there have. The idea is often um, we have a UNESCO designation, which means the site will attract many more people, many more tourists from this. Um, the money flows and this money is going into the region, but that doesn't have too much to do with the values of the people um, living um, in the place or around the place. And, and uh, the UNESCO's human values like peace and sustainability are almost not covered in many UNESCO designated sites because they do not see really a reason why to talk about the subjects that might not have to do with, for example, an old, an old factory building at the first glance. So um, the question is, uh, if we are thinking about um, UNESCO designated sites, um, I took a picture here from, uh, from the Alps, um, and we have a guided walk in the Alps. Uh, how can we how can we link um, this not only to geology and to the to the outstanding universal values for the reason why this um, area became um, UNESCO designated, but also 
um, about the circumstances people are living on in this region and how the people live with the land today and what this means for the future and what this means against the big concepts um, UNESCO has. So all of that should be included in such activities. Um, the workshop I mentioned resulted in a report. You can you can download this report um, for free from the internet. Um, a report in which UNESCO uh, tried to explain what they expect from heritage interpretation. And I take one quote from uh, this report, which I found quite remarkable. It says, the duty related to education through value-based heritage interpretation should form the core mandate of the visitor centers in UNESCO designated sites and inspire their activities. So um, they're speaking about value-based heritage interpretations, also interesting. So um, they see values closely linked to uh, the interpretive approach. And um, they say that this is at the core it's a core mandate at the core of what visitor centers in UNESCO designated sites actually should deal with. Um, and they set up five points, um, five, five demands, uh, we could say, um, that uh, go with that. Uh, the first one is related to what I was talking before, um, the blue model with a with a bubble. So the multiple value layers means these different areas from the site's values to UNESCO's human values. So they should be considered. The second is that um, we should adopt integrated approaches. That means that um, the concepts UNESCO has, uh, the programs UNESCO has, should be included and somehow linked to this. This is what this presentation is basically about. The third is that uh, we should engage for exchanging, so get away from one-way communication and more getting into an exchange with people. The fourth is linked to that, um, to facilitate and mediate um, this exchange but also in um, thinking about the future, thinking about possible transformations. So what is our situation now and how, how should it be in future? And how can heritage sites help to, to um, foster this debate, this exchange? And the last one is to invest in capacity building. So to have more interpretive training actually at UNESCO designated sites to qualify people um, to, to let all these uh, points come true. Um, so this is quite a strong list and there are some, some demands behind. So if we say we take this as our working program in the interpretive profession, there are several subjects we should discuss, we should do some research about, and we should uh, develop practical approaches for. So in uh, uh, practice, this means in the end we come to a biosphere reserve in this case and we go through these uh, points that UNESCO is, is giving us on the way and we ask ourselves okay um, what does it mean now in terms of methods in terms of uh, approaches of selection of media of a whole interpretive planning process that should all, always seen also against the background of of these demands UNESCO is uh, brought on the way um, Looking at it from the other perspective, what heritage interpretation uh, is doing for its own uh, development, what we claim. Uh, you might remember that we had a, a study a few years ago in Interpret Europe about trends and developments in Europe. You can find this on our website. Um, that influence uh, interpre interpretation, the interpretive profession in its development. Uh, within this study, I think we came up with 60 uh, different trends and we filtered them down and we tried to find the most important and uh, three of the most important I want to show you. Uh, the first was, and this was, was very, very dominant at that time, the search for purpose that people got away um, from this materialist thinking and um, from also from this idea of having fun somehow and, and um, to, to more, what are, why are we here? What is it for? And what is the meaning? What, what is my meaning also? So this, this idea of search of purpose is, was a very thriving trend. It is still, but I think it was even more a few years ago, um, which means that people are, are searching for meaning when they approach heritage sites. 
The second is um, the rise of heritage communities of this idea, which is um, mainly the, uh, the concept, uh, the, the theme the conference is uh, dealing with, um, which also includes uh, the involvement of local people. Um, heritage interpretation often is seen as something that's offered to visitors from somewhere else, but um, we should remember that many people live closely around um, uh, heritage sites, are impacted by them, impact them, but also live in heritage sites. If you think about historic towns, uh, old city centers, so um, it makes perfect sense that uh, we have this, this group of people more in mind. And the third is that we uh, get away from experts telling people something about the heritage and get the people more involved and ask them actually to interpret their heritage and become more facilitators. We still use this word interpreter for what we do and who we are, but in fact this is no, no longer uh, something we should take so literally. Um, we should more become facilitators of the processes of people interpreting. Um, which is not as revolutionary as it might sound um, to some. Um, uh, basically, the idea, starting with the first point, the idea of uh, searching for purpose and getting more to the meaning aspect of uh, heritage interpretation was brought um, up about 20 years ago, um, mainly through David Lawson. You might know this book, Meaningful Interpretation, which he wrote at, um, at that time. Um, so I would say he was the one who brought us more back to this track of um, of really meaning making, not just um, sending messages and doing it in an entertaining way, um, but also um, to to get to the deeper, to the larger truth, as as Freeman Tilden said. And um, I could also quote uh, Freeman Tilden in this concern. Um, I search search for one quote from him, um, which. Uh, uh, I show it in a minute, which um, explains this this idea of uh, personal meaning making. Um, this this is the diagram we are working with at Interpret Europe since yes, uh, would say four five years. Um, it was also at the center of this publication, engaging citizens with Europe's cultural heritage, which put um, meaning um, in the focus. So. Um, Interpret Europe decided that we should really um, look at interpretation at the interpretive, interpretive process, um, focusing on this meaning aspect. Um, and that means meaning making by people. So not we make the meaning and the, the people should understand, but also we encourage the people for this meaning making process, which is implemented in this, um, in this um, diagram. Um, and behind this, um, I said, is this uh, idea, which uh, also is ex has been expressed by Tilden long ago, um, this quote says, interpretation actually aims not to do something to the visitor, but to provoke the listener to do something to himself. Um, this was not actually in the first uh, edition of, uh, of Tilden's book in 1957. It was in the second edition in 1967 um, when he suggested this. Um, and you all you know that, that we can interpret Tilden in many different ways, but this was also one of, this, one of his key thoughts. And we can go uh, much further back when we are asked usually, uh, why do you call this interpretation? We mentioned John Muir and this famous quote he uh, made in 1871. And this quote actually um, says, I'll interpret to get as near to the heart of the world as I can. So this is where interpretation is, is uh, it's why we call our profession uh, heritage interpretation. And what uh, John Muir did here was he described what he did. He, he was not, he didn't do guided walks or not many or, or, or he, he didn't work on panels or something. There was not much visitors in the, the Yosemite area when he lived there and wrote this. Um, it was more about him and his uh, search for meaning, search for purpose. Um, in heritage, in, in this case, a natural heritage wilderness, I called it. Um, so the process that the person interprets um, for his or her self, um, and that this pro that this is facilitated by us, is really at the core of heritage interpretation. It's nothing very new now. 
Um, I promised that I would like to give you an insight in UNESCO's learning programs, and you might remember from what I said in the beginning um, that we want to link this now to heritage interpretation. Um, I only brought a few sheets. I do not want to go too deep in this, but you can also always find um, the quotes on the sheet so you can find all sources that are mentioned here on the internet. So you can get them all as, as PDFs. Um, you remember from the first uh, part of the presentation what UNESCO is standing for. Um, it considers ways of reflecting upon human values in order to foster peaceful development towards a more sustainable future. So these are key words, peace and sustainability is always what UNESCO is value very much um, against the background of human values. And one other aspect I would like to highlight is um, that UNESCO supports learning at natural and cultural heritage sites and has a rather holistic approach in this compared to other organizations. So this combination between nature and culture um, is critical to many interpreters. So we often complain that we have to do either with nature conservation organizations or with uh, culture, the cultural field, and they often in the culture sector, they distinguish even between movable and non-movable, tangible heritage. So there's a lot of structuring behind while we often advocate for having a more holistic uh, view on the things and uh, UNESCO shares this. So UNESCO is one of the few organizations that is really all under their umbrella and does not distinguishing um, so much between these things. Um, the two programs I would like to refer to are one is the Education for Sustainable Development, ESD. Um, that was very important for UNESCO a few years ago. We had the decade, uh, actually United Nations decade for education for sustainable development from 2005 to 2014. So many people were working in this field and trying to develop something in this direction. And uh, after this ended, uh, UNESCO said we would like to uh, focus now on the idea of global citizenship. So they created this concept of global citizenship education, um, which uh, is now on the on top of the agenda, you could say, in terms of UNESCO learning programs. And I would like to give you a, a short insight only into these, uh, these two programs and mentioning some points that I find quite interesting in our context. For, uh, UNESCO, uh, for uh, Education for Sustainable Development, um, I took out one chart which showing their teaching and learning strategies. And please keep in mind what we were discussing before about the different trends. We have trends and developments um, that are asking heritage interpretation to react and also the ideas we had uh, when we said we will focus on this meaning aspect. This teaching and learning strategies, it's, this is the, the complete list of chapters from a longer publication which you can find. Uh, in the internet, and I did not select points. So this is the complete list. So if you go through this list um, and ask yourself, what does this have to do with heritage interpretation? It's quite surprising because um, the first point in the list already, experiential learning, it says that people should learn from the experiences they have and you know, first-hand experiences on the is at the heart of um, heritage interpretation. The second point, storytelling, that we should link facts to um, narratives, to stories, and uh, try to deal with stories rather than with isolated facts. That's also from the very beginning um, uh, subject of interpretation. Then values education is for UNESCO very important. And I would say in the last years we made some progress in this field to bring values and the idea of values education more to the mind of people, inquiring learning so that, that people have the chance to explore something and um, we interpret what they actually explored and discovered. Um, appropriate assessment that they are able to assess situations, information, facts and uh, come up to a um, to an opinion about it, um, which is a little bit more um, yeah, challenging maybe. Um, future problem solving, so that all what we do um, should be 
referring to future, not so much only to the past, so not just to understand how people um, were acting a few hundred years ago, but also what this means for us today now. Um, learning outside the classroom makes it clear that all the concepts for UNESCO are mainly also written for schools for formal learning. Um, for us, this is what we what we do in interpretation, nothing else. We never would go into the classroom. And um, the last point, community problem solving, has again to do with what we are dealing here um, at the conference, so how to in integrate, include um, people and their concerns into the process. So if you look at this list, um, I would say you, you could say maybe 60%, 70% is what almost all interpreters who do quality interpretation do. And there is another maybe 20% um, where we could say, yes, we could do, we, we could, it, it fits to our, to our genes and we could um, have some progress in this concern. So in the end, you might end up with about 90% of what is in this um, Education for Sustainable Development um, strategies is also in interpretation. So it is not that we say um, we approach something completely new now and try to revolutionize what we do. Uh, it is more that we adapt some things and give them another color and uh, try to focus a little bit on other aspects, but it is um, most of this is very valuable reading for um, every interpreter. Um, the other concept I mentioned was global citizenship education, and I also show you just one slide for this, one slide for the one, one slide for the other. As I said, you can get much deeper into this, but this. Uh, this uh, list of lots of concepts, which I cannot really explain in, in detail, is a little bit tiring, so I, do, I will not continue with this, but there are many more behind which you can find there. Um, so global citizenship education is now going much more into the value sector. Um, it's about being respectful, inclusive, interactive as a person. It's about uh, learning processes that are learner-centered and culturally responsive. So taking into consideration what the people are and what they bring uh, to a side in our case. Uh, embedding authentic performance tasks, giving the people the chance to perform and um, deal with this. Drawing on globally oriented learning. So looking at the bigger picture from local to global. Uh, including reflection, self-assessment, and peer feedback. So not just an expert um, assessing uh, how people act, but they are um, um, encouraged and enabled also to uh, assess themselves. Um, learning in varied contexts. So we give different learning situations because they help the people to develop and to have the teacher or interpreter as a role model. Um, so again, if you look at this list and say, okay, how, how far is that from what we do in interpretation, you might come to, to a similar um, assessment as in the previous concept um, that half of it maybe is what we do and what we want to do. And some points are quite interesting and uh, we might think about how to integrate them, include them in uh, what we do in heritage interpretation. So same result. Um, and it's not too challenging to include these aspects into um, our work. Um, if you go to a heritage site again, now I took a World Heritage site in the end, um, and think what usually is done at such sites and uh, what we expect, what people, what people might like to hear and what people are dealing with. Um, this is one side and the other side is if we watch the people around the sites and, and try to find out what drives them and why they are there, uh, we might come on to other conclusions and to other concepts. And to this picture, I liked it very much in uh, at the same place at Grand Plus in, in Brussels, where the two guys just took a bottle of wine, sit down in the middle of the place and um, 
enjoy this atmosphere and feel that this is the right place to um, to reflect upon some things yeah whatever they are talking about i do not know um but um, it shows that people search heritage people have a relation to heritage and the question is what we can do more than just telling the story of the site or or describing it's it's in this case again outstanding universal value um we have many sensitive sites all across Europe. And if you have these two concepts in mind, I was just mentioning education for sustainable development and global citizenship education. Um, there is much material we could use at especially these sites. This is no UNESCO World Heritage Site. I think it's the only picture I took which no UNESCO site. Um, because what happens there is sometimes controversial. So at Flanders Fields, the battlefields of the First World War, not all interpretation is really in accordance with uh, UNESCO's values and what UNESCO would like to see uh, when we are talking about such sites. Um, yeah. And uh, one, one very strong picture I feel, uh, that's a picture which I took from, from Associated Press, so that I did not take this picture um, you, you remember when uh, when uh, Notre Dame burned uh, the pictures of people standing at the Seine and uh, being being much concerned uh, and moved by uh, what happened there. So at this point, you you realize that sometimes um, we live with our heritage, and um, at in certain situations we become aware of it, and it has very much impact on the people. So the question how we can relate this to um, the concepts I was just um, talking about um, from, from UNESCO. Um, the fourth point uh, is the last in, uh, in my list, actually. Um, what can heritage interpretation do now to support UNESCO? Um, I would like to mention some things um, we did in last years uh, where we already were considering uh, points in this direction at Interpret Europe. Um, and I want to mention this uh, this study, and I think it's the, the most important paper we wrote uh, in uh, in recent years, engaging citizens with Europe's cultural heritage. This was uh, what, what we achieved the um, Altiero Spinelli a Prize from the European Union, which has a lot to do with values and, and uh, frames, actually, and is, has a lot to do with what I was talking before, but when I was explaining what UNESCO is up to. So, um, this is what we what we are. I think since 2016, we can say we are we are dealing with these things in uh, in individual Europe all the time. Um, and the um, model, the the diagram I showed you before, is referring to this. We already talked about the meaning aspect that this is in the center, but you see that there are other aspects: experience, stewardship, and participation are mentioned in this. A diagram, and um, there are four qualities behind. Um, the, we are we are striving for, especially in our training program at Interbit Europe. So referring to meaning, um, that we like to offer paths to deeper meaning, and offer paths means basically that we suggest um, meaning and that we invite people also to come up with their ideas of meaning. So what is meaningful to them? Um, at heritage sites and get into ex exchange about this, um, that we turn the heritage phenomena into immediate experiences. So we believe that this experience learning is really at the heart of what we can do if we compare it to what happens in a, a school environment or in an environment, in a virtual environment like here. Um, to have this first-hand experience is to stand on a site and to catch the spirit of a site has a has a very uh, deep impact on people. Um, the third uh, buzzword was participation, which also plays a strong role here um, at the conference. Um, so provoking resonance and participation in people, which means not only that they are attended, but also that they are involved, that we give them the chance also to um, decide what to do and what to talk about and to choose some subjects. This is all behind um, this. And uh, finally, to foster stewardship for all heritage. So not just caring for the local side and um, uh, linking it to some ideology, but also to um, to cherish that there is heritage for all people and that different people 
have similar heritage which is maybe just um, has a different background so mainly if you think about religion um, this is something where we can say that religion is something that's very important for many people so many people are driven by it but we have different religions and the question is how can we encourage people um, to to um, cherish this variety of different um, re religions in this case so of all heritage so these are the qualities that are behind our work at Indobit Europe especially as I said in um, in uh, the training program and uh, the workshop that is parallel to my presentation here from uh, from Valya Stagiotti actually um, you would see there how this is put into practice I can only recommend you um, that you look that you watch the recording of this workshop since you cannot uh, be there but um, if I would continue and say okay what does all this theory now mean in practice um, I'm sure this is what what uh, Walia actually does but I'm here in the theory part and I want to highlight some other aspects we were dealing with where I find we have some connection to um, the UNESCO concepts um, one is uh, we were discussing this concept of key phenomena of sustainability um, sustainability you might have in mind is always as always to do with at least three uh, fields um, economy and uh, equity so the social aspects and ecology um, and we derived a model uh, from this um, where we said okay let's search for heritage phenomena that include all these fields and where it is easy um, to to talk about them in some cases it is in others it's not it's not not always easy to bring a, an abstract concept in a context with a with a heritage interpretation situation um, but so we said okay we um, we define what is a key phenomenon for sustainability and we said that uh, one aspect is that the idea of uh, protecting natural assets should be included uh, the idea of equally sharing national as natural assets and um, the idea of carefully using natural assets which is reflecting basically this ecology social and economy uh, aspect of uh, sustainability and we said we want to see this um, against the background of the timeline so from the past to the future and uh, from the local to the global aspect so here and somewhere else so these are basically five points you can say one two three four five that should be included um, in a key phenomenon for sustainability and um, this sounds very abstract now but if you if you put it uh, um, to the side and uh, look at one one heritage phenomenon and I show the historic granary here in the in the Swiss Alps um, you can discuss easily um, how natural assets were protected in this this case how they were equally shared or were they equally shared um, how they were used how they were not used so in a granary and also um, the the seed for the next year which was never touched so these are all aspects you can discuss around this you can say how was it done in earlier times and how, how do, we, do we do storage uh, today in um, in just in time times um, and how is it done here in uh, in Switzerland and how is it done where people maybe visitors tourists from other countries come from because you have such solutions of course in in many different uh, countries in very different ways so um, an interpretive talk around such a granary could include all aspects of uh, sustainability in a very easy way um, without people giving uh, giving people the feeling they are talking about something very abstract here why they would like much more enjoy um, the, the setting and the environment and the, the cultural surroundings so this is possible um, and one more um, aspect which we which we describe very intensely in the uh, engaging citizens uh, study which I just show again you can download it from our website um, was about values and mental frames um, so you remember that uh, global citizenship education was basically organized around values and um, we are working with this uh, with this uh, value circle um, which resulted from a very intensive work from uh, from Shalom Schwartz 
um, who brought all values together that people are driven by. So he, he uh, all of this like security, hedonism, he, all, he says all of these are values uh, people are driven by. And of course, some um, result in this and others result in something different. And most of what we heard before from UNESCO um, results in that that part in the value circle, which is called here self-transcendence values, so universalism values, like peace, sustainability, um, combat climate change, all the things you've seen in the UNESCO program. So the question is, how can we deal with this and how can we encourage reflection, especially um, about such values? Um, and they are actually not only the values of UNESCO, of course, they are also, this is from the, uh, the Treaty of the European Union, um, human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, rule of law, all these um, things that are basics of uh, democrat democratic societies um, are meant by this. So that's the interesting thing that, um, that in the preambles of all these declarations, we have these self-transcending values while in practice, we often go to the values that are on the other side of the value circle, like power and achievement. So we have a lot of encouragement of competition, for example, um, while this is not really supporting many of these values that are usually in the preambles. Um, and I took uh, one quote from uh, the keynote address this morning from uh, Katrin Merkel, where she said, um, if it is not only the objects and places in themselves that are important about cultural heritage, but the meanings and uses that people attach to them and the values they represent, the act of interpretation and mediation is key. So she linked interpretation to mediation. So what is what we discussed before to give people um, more the opportunity to interpret, to search for the meanings um, so meanings of the people, for the people, for the values behind, and then get into an exchange about that. I found this very nice because uh, the background of the Faro Convention, I, I actually, um, because it's much supporting of what I, what I was talking before, uh, on the one hand from UNESCO's demands, on the one hand, uh, on the other hand, um, regarding the trends and, and developments we have to deal with. Um, I need to mention, I always like to do this, um, this uh, studies from, um, from uh, was, a, was actually a consortium of NGOs in UK uh, who came up with this idea of the common cause. And they were thinking a lot about values and you, feel, you will find these ideas about the value circle and how to deal with it um, all in there. Um, WWF and Oxfam were leading in this. Uh, today it's a foundation, the Common Cause Foundation actually, dealing with values and frames in society. And this is a link, valuesandframes.org. So whoever is interested in this field of uh, de dealing with values and frames, um, please go to this website, you, fi you find a collection of uh, different publications, they're all for free, uh, where this idea um, uh, around the value circle is uh, transferred to different sectors like nature or um, um, justice or art or culture. So um, every, every uh, branch is basically mirrored uh, through this. So please have a look at that if you're interested in it. So, what does this uh, presentation suggest in the end? I, I tried to put up three suggestions um, that I would like to give you um, into the discussion and uh, in, on your way through the conference. Um, the one is that we should consider um, new trends and include some of the key aspects of UNESCO's learning programs in regular interpretive training. We are working on this at the moment at Interpret Europe. So we have a training policy and we try to include more aspects from uh, UNESCO, from UNESCO's learning programs into our own training policy so that we can say our training courses that we run at Interpret Europe um, really mirror these ideas I was talking about before. The second point is that we um, see a need also for reviewing our interpretive theory. Um, there are some research uh, questions which, which would result from this. 
and think about what does this mean in practice. So what does it mean for people at, in the first place, maybe UNESCO designated sites um, to act to uh, perform heritage interpretation, but I think in a, in a second phase also, um, what do we learn from these experiences at UNESCO designated sites, which what UNESCO calls value-based heritage interpretation, and how can we transfer this to other um, heritage sites and situations? And uh, the third and last, um, how uh, we can support UNESCO um, by encouraging people to interpret heritage in a way that is more forward-looking to the uh, 21st century and that meets more the challenges of the 21st century. I think that uh, interpretation is playing a key role in this. I do not want to overestimate it, but um, we need to see that um, Many learning is taking place in the formal sector. Um, and that's actually where, for example, the European Union is, is almost always focusing on, upon. And many learning in the formal sector is much, um, uh, um, has much to do with achievements, has much to do with uh, getting ready for a job. While we have the privilege at uh, heritage sites that we can much more focus on this idea of uh, values and, on, and encourage people actually to reflect upon situations. So um, if you go back to the to the very first, to the film I shown you, now thinking where is the place where people can learn about all these things? I would say heritage sites are an excellent place to do this, and we should try to meet this challenge um, in the interpretive profession. So thank you very much. That was it, and I'm uh, curious about your questions.